Orais e Evo Leven. The International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals is now in session. L'audience du mécanisme international appelé à exercer les fonctions résiduelles des tribunaux pénals est ouverte. Please, be seated. Veuillez vous asseoir. Good morning to everyone. Mr. Registrar, could you kindly call the case, please? Yes, Your Honor. Good morning, Your Honors. This is case number MICT-18-116-A. In the appeal case of the prosecutor versus Marie Rose Fatuma, the appeal case of the prosecutor versus Marie Rose Fatuma, Dick Prudence Mishili, and Augustine Gerbafari. Sitting today, the 29th day of June, 2022. Thank you, Anas. I thank you. Before proceeding with the appearances of the parties, I note that members or some members of the prosecution, Mr. Augustine Ingerabatoire himself and his counsel are participating via video conference link. And uh, so now I am in a position to ask for appearances of the parties. Counsel for Ms. Marie Rose Fatuma, please. In this case, I assist Madame Marie Rose Fatuma And uh, in my team, there is uh, Jan Edward, uh, who is following us from The Hague. Uh, I'm a member of Rwanda Bar Association. Yes, and your name, please? My name is Maitre Gatera Gashabana. Okay, thank you very much. Member of the Rwanda Bar Association. I thank you very much. Ms. Fatuma? Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Fatuma, can you hear and follow the proceedings in the language that you understand? Thank you. Yes. I ask for counsel for Ms. Mr. Dick Prudence Munyashule. Uh, good morning, Your Honors. Morning. Dick Munishuli is here this morning in person. He also appears through his attorney, Kurt Kearns, and I'm assisted uh, by Philippe La Rochelle, a member of the Quebec Bar, Dragon Ivatic in The Hague, and Laura Le Luca in the gallery. Thank you. I thank you. Mr. Munishuli, can you hear the proceedings in a language that you understand? Yes. Thank you. Counsel for Mr. Ingira Batuare. Mr. President, my name is Sam Blom Cooper of the Bar of England and Wales. I appear by video link this morning from London. Mr. Ngira Batwari himself appears by video link from Senegal. And today I'm assisted by counsel from the Bar of England and Wales, Mr. James Jackson, who appears via video link from The Hague, and Ms. Chiara Loyera also. Thank you. I thank you. Uh, Mr. Ingira Batwara, can you hear the proceedings in the language that you understand? Oui, j'arrive à suivre, Monsieur. Yes, I can follow the proceedings in French, Mr. President. Thank you. So um, uh, I come to the prosecution. Uh, who is appearing for the prosecution today? 
Good morning, Jana. Um, from The Hague, Senior Appeals Counsel Barbara Goy and Laurel Baig, together with our case manager, Janet Stewart. We are joined in Arusha by our colleagues, Tembile Segota and Take Sanse. I thank you. So, that completes the listing. So in accordance with the scheduling order issued by myself on the 13th of May of this year, and pursuant to Rule 154D of the Mechanism's Rules of Procedure and Evidence, the Appeals Chamber pronounces its judgment today in the case of Prosecutor versus Marie Rose Fatuma et al. I will not read the full text of the judgment, but instead will summarize the essential issues on appeal and central filing, findings of the Appeals Chamber. At the conclusion, I will read out the full text of the disposition of the judgment, and uh, this oral here summary does not constitute any part of the official and authoritative uh, judgment which will be distributed in writing to the parties at the end of the hearing. On 20th December 2012, Trial Chamber 2 of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda convicted Augustine Ingira Batware of direct and public incitement to commit genocide, relying primarily on the direct evidence of prosecution witnesses ANAN and ANAT. It further found in Gira Batuare, guilty of instigating and aiding and abetting genocide, principally on the basis of the direct evidence of prosecution witnesses, ANAE and ANAM, which was corroborated by the evidence of prosecution witness ANAL. On 18th December 2014, the Appeals Chamber affirmed Ingira Batuare's conviction for committing direct and public incitement to commit genocide, and by majority, his conviction for instigating and aiding and abetting genocide. The Appeals Chamber imposed on Ingira Batuare a sentence of 30 years of imprisonment. On 8 July 2016, Ingira Batuare filed a motion before the Appeals Chamber seeking review of his conviction on the basis that following the rendering of the Appeals Judgment, witnesses ANAN, ANAT, ANAE, and ANAM had recanted their trial testimonies. On the 27th September 2019, the Appeals Chamber issued a review judgment in which it found that Ingira Batwara had failed to prove that the recounting witnesses had truthfully recounted their trial testimonies. Consequently, the appeal judgment was affirmed in all respects. While the Ingira Batwara review proceedings were still ongoing, Maximilian Turinabo, Anselm Inzabonimpa, Jean de Dieu Indagi Mana, Marie Rose Fatuma, and Dick Prudence Munyashuli were charged with contempt and or incitement to commit contempt on the basis of allegations of interference with inter alia, the recanting witnesses and or witnesses witness ANAL, or violation of court's orders. Shortly after the conclusion of the review proceedings, an indictment was confirmed against Ingira Batuare, charging him with uh, contempt and incitement to contempt, commit contempt on the basis of allegations of interference with, amongst others, the recounting witnesses and witness and ANAL interfere uh, and violation of court orders. The proceedings against Maximilian Turinabo 
were terminated on 19th April 2021 following his death. On 25 June 2021, the single judge found in Zabonimpa, in Dagi Mana, and Fatuma guilty of contempt for having interfered with the administration of justice and acquitted them of incitement to commit com contempt. The single judge sentenced each of them to, quote, time served, unquote. The single judge acquitted Munyashuli of contempt and issued a warning to him. The single judge found Ingira Batwara guilty of contempt for having interfered with the administration of justice and for having violated court orders and acquitted him of incitement to commit contempt. The single judge sentenced Ingira Batwara to two years of imprisonment to run concurrently with the sentence of 30 years of imprisonment that he is already serving. Fatuma filed an appeal challenging her conviction and sentence. She requests that the appeals chamber vacate her conviction and quash her sentence, or in the event her conviction remains undisturbed, impose either a significantly lesser sentence of imprisonment or a fine deemed paid by virtue of the time she has spent in detention. The prosecution filed an appeal challenging Munyashuli's acquittal and the sentence imposed on Ingi Rabatware. It requests that the appeals chamber convict Munyashuli of contempt and sentence him accordingly. And with respect to Ingira Batwara, the prosecution requests that the appeals chamber order that he serve his sentence of two years of imprisonment for contempt consecutively with the sentence of 30 years imprisonment that he is already serving. On 4th February 2022, the appeals chamber found that the information before it enabling it to reach the, an informed decision on the appeals and that balancing all interests involved, holding an oral hearing was not necessary. So I now turn to the appeal of Marirose Fatuma. The single judge found Fatuma guilty pursuant to Article 14A of the statute and Rule 90A, subparagraph so 4 of the rules, for having interfered with the administration of justice by first prompting relatives of witness ANAL slash TNN6 here and after referred to as witness ANAL uh, to persuade and offer a financial incentive to the witness in exchange for recounting the testimony she had given during Ingira Batwara's um, uh, trial. Second, instructing witness ANAL on what to say when interviewed by Ingira Batwara's defense. And third, offering witness ANAL a financial incentive to cooperate and recount. Under the first and third grounds of appeal, Fatuma submits that the single judge erred in accepting witness ANAL's evidence that Fatuma had offered the witness a financial incentive to recount her prior testimony given during Ingira Batwara's ICTR trial. Fatuma contests inter alia the single judge's reliance on a contemporaneous statement given by the witness to the Witness Support and Protection Unit of the Mechanism in 2016. The Appeals Chamber concludes that the single judge erred in finding that this statement corroborated the witness's later testimony 
as prior consistent statements cannot be used to bolster a witness's credibility except to rebut a charge of recent fabrication of evidence. Nevertheless, the Appeals Chamber finds that in view of the other evidence relied on by the single judge as corroborating witness ANAL's testimony, this error does not invalidate the single judge's conclusion that Fatuma had offered the witness a financial incentive in exchange for her recantation. Therefore, the Appeals Chamber dismisses Fatuma's first and third ground of appeal. Under her second ground of appeal, Fatuma submits that the single judge erred in failing to take into consideration certain aspects of the wit of witnesses A and AL's testimony that were untruthful and in this way minimizing the extent to which her evidence should have been treated uh, with caution. For the reasons stated in the judgment, the Appeals Chamber finds that Fatuma fails to demonstrate that the single judge committed any error in this respect and dismisses Fatuma's second ground of appeal. Under her fourth ground of appeal, Fatuma argues that the single judge erred in finding that she sent relatives of witness ANAL to convince the witness to recount her testimony given during Ingira Batwara's ICTR trial. As detailed in the judgment, the appeals chamber finds that the single judge erred in concluding that Fatuma encouraged M and F to speak with witness ANAL for the purpose of having the witness recount her prior testimony. However, the appeals chamber finds no error in the single judge's assessment of the evidence that Fatuma prompted witness ANAL's younger sister to persuade the witness to change her prior testimony. Similarly, Fatuma fails to show that the single judge erred in finding that during a meeting at the Stella Maris Church, Fatuma provided the witness with the questions that she would be asked by Ingira Batwara's defense, instructed the witness what to say, and offered the witness a financial incentive for cooperating and recounting her prior testimony. The appeals chamber therefore finds that the single judge's error in finding that Fatuma encouraged M and F to speak with witness ANAL did not undermine the conclusion that Fatuma interfered with the administration of justice. The appeals chamber therefore dismisses Fatuma's fourth ground of appeal. For the reasons set out in the judgment, the appeals chamber dismisses Fatuma's fifth ground of appeal under which she argues that the single judge erred in failing to provide a reasoned opinion for rejecting her defense theory of the case. The appeals chamber also dismisses Fatuma's sixth ground of appeal as she fails to demonstrate that the single judge erred in failing to consider her, her final brief submissions in a language that he understood. understood. Under her seventh and eighth ground of appeal, Fatuma argues that in sentencing her to time served, the single judge imposed a manifestly excessive sentence. The Appeals Chamber recalls that pursuant to Article 22.1 of the Statute and Rule 90G of the Rules, the penalties that may be imposed on a person found guilty of contempt are a term of imprisonment not exceeding seven years and or 
a fine not exceeding 50,000 euros. Considering that time served is not amongst the penalties provided in the statute and the rules that may be imposed on a person found guilty of contempt, the appeals chamber finds that by sentencing Fatuma to time served, the single judge did not impose a permissible sentence. Therefore, the appeals chamber proprio motu sets aside the sentence of time served imposed by the single judge and dismisses Fatuma's seventh and eighth grounds of appeal as moot. I turn now to the appeal of the prosecution. Under count three of the Inzabonimpa et al. indictment, the prosecution alleged that on 15th July 2017, Munye Shuli revealed to Maximilian Turinabo the identities of the recanting witnesses in, via, in knowing violation of the protective measures ordered in the Ingira Batwara case. In the trial judgment, the single judge noted that Turinabo was a resource person for the defense during the Ingira Batwara ICTR trial and review proceedings and that the recanting witnesses' identities had been previously revealed to Turinabo by Nzabonimpa. In this regard, the single judge found that first, quote, it cannot be reasonably said that Munyashuli revealed any identifying information to Turinabo that was somehow new or secret to Turinabo and that in doing so, in a private conversation, Munyashuli made this information openly known, unquote. The single judge further found that even if Munyashuli's conversation with Turinabo could be construed as prohibited disclosure of protected information, he was not satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that Munyashuli had the requisite mens rea for a violation of Rule 90, uh, paragraph A, subparagraph 2 of the rules. The single judge therefore acquitted Munyashuli of contempt under count three of the Inzabonimpa et al. indictment in relation to this allegation. Under its first ground of appeal, the prosecution submits that the single judge erred in failing to convict Munyashuli of contempt by first applying an incorrect definition of disclosure and finding that Munyashuli did not disclose protected information in violation of court orders and second, finding that Munyashuli did not possess the mens rea for contempt when disclosing protected information. The appeals chamber notes that there is no requirement in jurisprudence that unauthorized disclosure of protected information must take place in a public domain or be accessible to the general public in order to amount to an interference with the administration of justice under Rule 90, paragraph A, subparagraph 2 of the rules. In addition, the rules and jurisprudence do not sustain the proposition that release of protected information does not amount to disclosure in circumstances where the recipient is already in possession of such information. The Appeals Chamber considers that the Jovic contempt appeal judgment and the Shogoza attempt a contempt appeal judgment both support the principle that release, whether in a public or private domain of protected information, may constitute unauthorized disclosure irrespective of whether the intended recipient of such information was already aware of it due to previous disclosure by another person. Accordingly, the appeals chamber finds that the single judge erred in law in considering that Munya Shuli did not disclose protected information in violation of the relevant protective measures decisions. The appeals chamber notes 
that the relevant protective measures decisions prohibit disclosure of information identifying the recounting witnesses directly or indirectly to any person or entity outside of the defense and prosecution teams and provide no conditions that would permit release of such information beyond these terms, including on the basis of prior disclosure. Having reviewed the evidence in relation to the conversation that took place between Munyashuli and Turinabo on 15th July 2017, the Appeals Chamber agrees with the single judge's finding that there is no doubt that Munyashuli mentioned the names of the recounting witnesses to Turinabo. The Appeals Chamber further notes that although Turinabo was a resource person for the defense during the Ngirabatwara ICTR trial and review proceedings, Munyashuli confirmed in his testimony that Turinabo was not officially part of the defense team in the review proceedings. The Appeals Chamber is therefore convinced beyond reasonable doubt that by mentioning the name of the recanting witnesses to Turinabo, who was not a member of the defense team, Munyashuli disclosed protected information in violation of the relevant protective measures decision. The Appeals Chamber further finds that the single judge erred in concluding that Munyashuli did not have the requisite mens rea for contempt in this regard. The Appeals Chamber therefore grants the prosecution first ground of appeal and finds Munyashuli guilty of contempt pursuant to Article 14A of the Statute and Rule 90, Paragraph A, Subparagraph 2 of the rules by disclosing the identities of the recanting witnesses in knowing violation of a court order. Under count three of the Ndabon Empire toll indictment, Munyashuli was also charged with contempt for having had prohibited indirect contact with the recounting witnesses in knowing violation of a court order. The single judge found that through his conversation with Turinabo on 15th July 2017, Munyashuli initiated indirect contact with protected witnesses, which amounted to a violation of the relevant protective measures decisions. Nevertheless, the single judge acquitted Munyashuli under count three of the Nzabon Empire at all indictment uh, of contempt in relation to this allegation and instead issued him a warning to closely scrutinize applicable witness protection measures in future cases. Under its second ground of appeal, the prosecution submits that the single judge erred in declining to enter a conviction against Munyashuli for contempt through having had prohibited and direct contact with protective measure, witnesses. As explained in the judgment, the appeals chamber considers that the textual and contextual interpretation of the rules supports the principle that once a charge is proven beyond reasonable doubt, a finding of guilt follows. Considering that the rules apply mutatis mutandis to proceedings under Rule 90 of the rules. This principle, therefore, similarly applies to contempt proceedings. In addition, the, a trial chamber is bound to enter convictions for all distinct crimes which have been proven in order to fully reflect the criminality of the convicted person. For the reasons elaborated in the judgment, the appeals chamber finds that the single judge erred in law in concluding that Munyashuli's proven violation of the relevant protective measure decisions should not result in criminal responsibility and consequently in declining to enter a conviction against him 
under count three of the Inzabon Empire at all indictment. Consequently, the appeals chamber grants the prosecution's second ground of appeal and finds Munia Shuli guilty of contempt pursuant to Article 14A of the Statute and Rule 98 three of the rules by having had prohibited in direct contact with the recounting witnesses in knowing violation of a court order. Under its third ground of appeal, the prosecution submits that the single judge erred in law in ordering that Ingira Batuare's two-year sentence for contempt be served concurrently with the 30-year sentence that he is already serving. The appeals chamber records that pursuant to Rule 104C of the rules, if the single judge finds an accused guilty of on one or more of the charges contained in an indictment, he or she shall impose a sentence in respect of each finding of guilt, of guilt and indicate whether such sentences shall be served consecutively or concurrently. However, neither the statute nor the rules vest in the single judge the power to order that a sentence for contempt be served concurrently with a previous sentence imposed on the same accused in separate proceedings under a different indictment before the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the ICTR, or the mechanism. The appeals chamber therefore finds that the single judge erred in law in ordering that Ingira Batwara's sentence of two years of imprisonment for contempt be served concurrently with the sentence of 30 years of imprisonment that he is already serving in relation to his convictions for genocide and direct and public incitement to commit genocide. Accordingly, the appeals chamber grants the prosecution's third ground of appeal and sets aside the concurrent sentence of two years of imprisonment imposed on Ingira Batwares by the single judge. I would like to ask now Ms. Fatuma and Mr. Munyashuli to stand while I read the full text of the disposition of the appeals judgment. Mr. Ingira Batuare, for technical reasons, you may remain seated. For the foregoing reasons, the Appeals Chamber, pursuant to Article 23 of the Statute and Rule 144 of the Rules, noting the written submissions of the parties, sitting in open session, dismisses Fatuma's appeal in its entirety, sets aside proprio motu Fatuma's sentence of, quote, time served, unquote, and imposes a sentence of 11 months of imprisonment, declares in accordance with Rule 125C of the rules that Fatuma's sentence has been served in view of the credit for her detention in the custody of the mechanism pending trial. Grants the prosecution's first and second ground of appeal and reverses Munyashuli's acquittal under count three of the Nzabonimpa at all indictment and finds Munyashuli guilty pursuing to Article 1.4 of the statute and Rule 98.3, 2 and 3 of the rules and enters a conviction under count 3 of the Nzabonimpa at all indictment for contempt through knowingly and willfully interfering uh, with the administration of justice imposes on Munia Shuli a sentence of five months of imprisonment, declares in accordance with Rule 125 of the rules that Munia Shuli's sentence has been served in view of the credit for his detention in the custody of the mechanisms pending trial, grants prosecution's third 
ground of appeal, sets aside uh, in Girabatwari's concurrent sentence of two years of imprisonment and imposes Judge Ori dissenting a sentence of two years of imprisonment to be served consecutively to his sentence of 30 years of imprisonment that he is already serving and rules that the judgment shall be enforced immediately pursuant to Rule 145A of the rules. Judge Alphonse Ori appends a partially dissenting opinion. Mr. Registrar, after we rise, please distribute copies of the written judgment to the parties who are present in the courtroom and make the necessary arrangements for the delivery of copies of the written judgment to the parties who are participating remotely in today's uh, hearing. This uh, partly concludes the appellate proceedings in this case. I'm saying partly concludes, uh, not because I have got anything uh, more to say about this case, but because I want to make um, a strictly personal uh, statement. Before I uh, leave you, um, uh, you all know that tomorrow is my last day as president of this, ju this judicial body. And uh, this is also my last judgment, although I still have a couple of uh, decisions Yeah, um, they are sitting down, yeah. yeah. Uh, this is also my last judgment, although I have some decisions uh, that uh, I will need to issue uh, between now and tomorrow that are completely unrelated to this case. Uh, it's a difficult uh, moment for me, certainly not an enviable one. Um, uh, but I didn't want to let it pass without saying uh, a few words and a big thank you to all of you present here today uh, or attending remotely via video link, as well as others who have participated in this case in the past and who are still participating that are not here. I thank you all for your contribution, which made it possible for us to conduct this case and bring it to an end uh, with exceptional speed. I also wish to take advantage of today's sitting to thank all the staff of the mechanism for their hard work and dedication uh, in the fight against impunity and for the loyalty to an institution which, like its predecessor tribunals, showed and continues to show the way forward in this difficult task. I will, as you know, continue to serve as a judge on the roster of the mechanism and so I promise you that we will meet again, but before closing, and last but not least, I wish to thank my two colleagues, Judge Ori and Judge Panton, for having worked with me and with our staff in the elaboration of uh, this judgment and, con and, and the uh, deliberations that preceded uh, the, the judgment. And I also, of course, uh, wish to thank um, uh, my own staff uh, and uh, chambers, uh, headed in this case uh, by Ms. Um, uh, Emilia Viktorova, for their hard work, um, uh, which resulted in uh, us being able to come here today uh, and deliver this judgment before the termination of my term as uh, president. So I thank you all and I hope to see you all again. Thank you.